Well, like I said, welcome to Legacy Nashville. Now, if you have been here with us for a minute, and by a minute, I mean anywhere between January and now for the past six months, you have heard this amazing series that our senior pastor, Pastor Lyle, led us into on the book of Acts. Now, he preached down last Sunday, and y'all, we were learned teen. We were learned teen last Sunday as Pastor Lyle actually closed out our sermon series on the book of Acts. Now, how many of you were blessed by that series? That was an amazing series that we went to as a church for six months. Holy Spirit said, do it. And guys, can we give it up for our senior pastors, Lyle and Allison Phillips right now? Because they will forever be known as a people that when God says do it, they go, okay. Because that's what happened at the top of this year. God said, Book of Acts, and Pastor Lyle said, here we go. So for six months, we got to learn the ins and outs. And how many of you know how good it is, how good it is to build something on the blueprint of all blueprints that belongs to the kingdom of heaven? Our church is being built on the blueprint of all blueprints. Amen? Well, today we actually are beginning a brand new series on worship. Come on, y'all, on worship. And y'all, if you don't know already, let it be known after today that Legacy knows how to worship. We know how to worship. You know, I was standing in here the second service and I just, Pastor Brian, I just want to take a second and say thank you. I want to say thank you for leading the charge, not just in our worship team, but over all of the things that you pastor now in our church, all of the things that you pastor now in our church, but just leading our people in such a way where if you don't know, you do get to know as you lead us into his presence by going, no, not me. How many of y'all notice how much he... He wants you. He wants you to sing to him. So I want to say thank you for being a consistent ushering into what it looks like to worship him and not this. Praise God. So thank you, Pastor Brian. Well, like I said, we're starting a new series on worship this morning. And I tell you, the Lord wants to speak. The Lord's got some things to say about worship. I think one of the biggest things the Lord would like to tell his people in today, not just today, but in today's time and culture, is that he would like for us to reshift our perspective and, and, and get into the heavenly realm of that worship is night and day and day and night. He wants us to stop limiting and contextualizing worship to one day of the week. And I believe the Lord wants to teach us how to do that well so that we're not waiting on people to do it for us. I believe the Lord wants to teach us in this series and beyond in our daily lives how to worship, why to worship him, when to worship, and to get outside of the box as an American Christian church that we only do it on Sunday when someone else starts it before us. And so the Lord's word is good, never comes back void. And today's message is called that worshiping is a sacrifice. And you know, we don't, I don't hardly ever know the, the song set, the list um, for Sunday mornings. And in the first service, they started singing, I want to be a living sacrifice. And I just felt like the Lord was like, I told you, I have something to say. I have something to say. Because after so many rounds in, in church and on our Christian walk, and even if we're fairly new, you, you get a lot, you get an, a very upfront teaching of, you know, Jesus' sacrifice, what it means to sacrifice for him, sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. And I felt like the Lord is like, no, I want us to understand what it means to sacrifice. Because Jesus Christ came down in human form because he understands what it means to sacrifice. When it's inconvenient, when you don't want to, and when it's hard. And worship is a sacrifice. Let's look at John chapter 4, verse 23. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Father, we desire to be a people 
who worships you in spirit and in truth. We desire to be a people who knows what it means to lay down ourselves, to sacrifice everything that comes between you and us, to sacrifice it in order to have more access to you in your presence. And so, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and do what only you can do and have your way as we learn how to continue to worship you every day of our lives. Amen. So in studying for this, I looked at the Hebrew and the Greek. And I told the first services, I said, any of you out there that studied this for like a degree or in your pastime, first of all, if it's in your pastime, I need to know you because you're a type of smart that I don't know yet. But like the Hebrew and the Greek, I opened this up. My husband gave me the strongest concordance. <laughs> And I was just like, God, it's just, it's so much meat. But you know what I love about it is that it's like a gradual learning. It get, takes you from milk to meat, which is so biblical. Hebrew and Greek is just a whole other thing for me. So I looked, I took the verse from John, and I looked up the New Testament and the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, and the New Testament, written in Greek, I wanted to know what do these words mean, worship and worshiper. And the Old Testament means to depress, prostrate, reflection in homage, loyalty to royalty or God, or the act of bowing down to someone superior. In the New Testament, in Greek, means to fawn or crouch to, prostrate oneself in homage, reverence or adoration. Now this is the one where I read it and I was like, oh, when we worship. Look at this. To motion toward the relationship nearness, or have access to. When we worship God, it is an active move to motion closer to his entity. We are not merely just sitting and partaking in a mechanical act. We are engaging our heart to move towards somebody because we love them. So what does it mean to sacrifice? Worship is a sacrifice. And when the Lord spoke that, I was like, well, let's define what sacrifice means. To suffer loss, to give up, to renounce, to injure or destroy, especially for an ideal belief or end. In the Oxford Dictionary, it means to surrender or give up or permit injury or disadvantage to for the sake of something else. Can I tell you what the beauty of that definition is? The one the only one who had to give bodily injury to himself to demote himself unto something else already done that sacrifice. Jesus Christ demoted himself, prostrated himself, and sacrificed his body so that we wouldn't have to cause bodily harm to ourselves. by definition in sacrifice in order to worship him. Jesus Christ already done took care of the ultimate sacrifice for us. So part of this definition where it talks about in order to do so, you have to rena injure yourself, permit injury or disadvantage to. We don't have to do any of that because he already did. The one true king died for us who didn't deserve it. And for some in his time that wanted him, to, wanted him gone. But he decided to do it anyway. So my question is then what do we have left to sacrifice? What do we sacrifice? He does not require our body or harm or injury to us. The answer to this question is in what we value. What do we attain value to? Because what we value in life is directly correlated to what we will sacrifice. Because let me tell you something, valuing something above God will lead to worshiping it. It will. It doesn't, it doesn't happen by accident either. What is having all your thoughts, all your time, your body, your intention, that is where you can do a self-audit, an internal audit of what you are truly valuing. What do you need to sacrifice? Here's a way to answer that question. If you were asked to give it up or if in order to have full access in worship to God, you were have to lay that aside for a moment, would you still come with your fullness to worship him? Because if the answer is, uh, then the question then is who are you really worshiping? We are human. We are created to worship. The question is who are you deciding to worship? 
It does not happen by accident. We choose. I love, I love what Pastor Brian has said before. He is a gentleman. God is a gentleman. He will not force his way. He will wait for your invitation because he loves us. It's a relationship. He will not force us to sacrifice something else. But I will tell you this, he will not be in competition with something else. It's either him or not him. So let's take a look at what the Bible, God's blueprint, tells us about worship. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, if you will, go there with me in your Bibles. Worship is a part of our identity. God made us worshipers. We were created to worship. It is our responsibility to worship him. In fact, the Bible in this scripture teaches us that every believer has been set apart by God to worship him as a priest. So let's read this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I believe one of the most anchoring things that keeps us from just watching worship that keeps us from turning church into a spectator sport. I believe one of the most anchoring things that keeps us from turning the American church into a talent show, into making someone behind a microphone the famous person, so you got to listen to them because all our Instagram is listening to them. I believe the most anchoring thing to keep us from behaving that way is remembering what you were saved from. 1 Peter 2.9 says, do all of that. To tell the people the darkness you were called out of. It's not about us. It's not about our comfortability. It's not about our convenience. It's about worshiping him so that everybody else who may not know him goes, what? I want to know. I want to know. You know, it's called the helmet of salvation for a reason. Because when your thoughts get messed up your feels start to follow. Don't get it twisted. It starts up here. Take captive every thought. It's called a helmet of salvation for a reason because the helmet is created to remind you of your salvation from what hell you were in to what promises you can go to. That's why it's important to wear it. It's not just Sunday school stuff. It prepares you to set aside your own self, your own thoughts, your own stuff. In order to fully lay prostrate to the one true king who did the ultimate sacrifice for you already. So what does it look like? What does worship look like? What can it look like? Well, let's look to the blueprint of all blueprints. Look look to the word of God. He wants all of us. He wants our hands. He wants our hearts. He wants our voice. He wants our thoughts. He wants all of us. In Psalm 141, verse 2, it says, May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. You see, what David understood was that God wanted more than just smoke from the incense. God wanted David's hands to rise. God went to David's hand in worship. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 says, I desire then that in every place that men should pray, the lifting of holy hands without anger or quarreling. It says something. This is surrender. This is surrender. Hands in some cultures are signs of loyalty. He wants our hands. He wants our heart. Did you know that it is possible to give the Lord your hands in worship and not your heart? When you get real good at, good at learning Christian behavior, you learn how to fit in without having to give your all. That's what worship looks like this. In the spirit, I, I imagine it like this. But in the natural, you can't tell no difference. And can I tell you, it doesn't matter who's watching. He's the one that knows and he's the one that wants to talk to us during worship. Psalm 150, verses 4 through 6. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It says let everything that has breath, not everything that has skill. Don't wait. Okay. Let everything that has breath, not let everything that has skill. This is why it's so important for us to move 
from a church that watches worship to a church that does worship. There's an invitation today to start the marker of learning what it looks like to be the one that is worshiping the one true king instead of waiting till you feel like it. Instead of waiting till you hear the right beat. Because worshiping God is not about a personality trait. Listen, if you know anything about me, I have a counseling background. I love it all. I will take, I will, I will take every conversation to personality, all this and so the staff knows. I love talking about it. It's great. But, but can I tell you, worshiping is not about a personality trait. We do not get to check our Indian grand number with the Lord first before we partake in worship. We do not to get, well, you know I'm a four, Lord. Now, don't come at me. I'm married an artist. That's why I feel comfortable coming at it like this. I'm a four, so I get to be my emo self, and I get to journal, and I'm not going to lift my hands because you know my heart is really deep in it. And I got my incense in my back pocket anyway. Like I said, don't come at me. I'm married into an artist. Or I'm a seven, which means I'm partying in a bag, and I value fun. What you valuing? Is it in the place of God? Are you valuing your own number, your own personality before him? So I'm a seven, and I got to wait till the drums come hard and strong. Because if it doesn't happen in the first two songs, I'm probably be out. <laughs> it's not a personality trait. It's a sacrifice, which means you don't get to hang on to everything and anything that's so familiar to you that gives you what you want. It's a sacrifice. <laughs> now, every now and then... You know, when I was younger, we grew up, I got baptized into the Catholic Church. I wasn't practicing Catholic, but I got baptized into it. And then as a kid, we were Southern Baptists. And there was non-denominational, which is like the safe transition into charismatic. And then we were like full-on charismatic. And it was kind of like a progression of worship styles, to be honest, even as a kid. It was like, like I said, I wasn't practicing Catholic. But, you know, Southern Baptist, the choir would come out. Oh, I love the choir and the blue robes. Those are like my fondest memories of church growing up with VBS. And so, you know, it was a little bit, you know, you're praising, you're singing. And the Holy Spirit will be felt in any of his spirit-filled churches. Because I felt the Holy Spirit in that Baptist church. And I have felt the Holy Spirit in a Church of Christ church where they'd be singing beautiful, beautiful hymns to the Lord. So the Lord goes where he's wanted. The Lord goes where he's worshipped. Okay? So don't get it twisted. I'm not talking about a progression into real worship. I'm just telling you my progression of having to learn how to worship more freely as I graduated. Okay? So Southern Baptist, we were singing. And then non-denominational, you know, you have the safe, the safe beat. The, the more confident and the more charismatic you get, you might have the elbow roll. And then the elbow roll with the hands. And then we went full charismatic with our South African pastors. And, man, that full char there was no easy jump. It was a tambourine at 4 o'clock and the hand at 11. And then when the organ started going, the tambourine was right here. But listen, I tell that story to tell you there were times where I was like, 2 and 4, got it. 8 and 6, got it. Okay. There are times where it is time for one-on-one -on -one worship classes. It's okay. It's okay because if your heart is engaged and you're like, okay, I see them. But your heart, again, what do you value? Is that motive coming from, I want to be accepted, I want to fit in with these people, or is it... Got it. I want to be with him. I want to be with him. I'm going to get the beer. What do you value in learning how to worship him freely and fully prostrate and rid of yourself so that you can be holy for him? And so what happens is, like, it doesn't matter where you are. The Lord doesn't care if you're in freshman level 101 courses or if you're in post-senior level 405 courses. He doesn't care. He's going to meet you where he is. The point is... Worshiping him is sacrificial. Of move, move yourself out the way so we can be fully in him. And every now and then, there's these things that will happen. 
I remember going, it was in grad school, and I just remember us getting a word on worshiping and preaching and all this sorts of stuff. And I just, there would be times where I was like, why are so many people watching? And then I would hear all these people talking bad about the more charismatic church. They're just crazy. That's just too drama. That's too much. It's too this. It's just, well, they only need to be worshiping like that because that's that certain type of people. Well, they only do that because she's, because she's of that certain culture. Well, that's only that because that's that certain type of church. Well, that's because that, because they, no, it's not a certain type of anything. It's not letters behind your last name. It's not the color of your skin. It's not the denomination of your church. It's not your socioeconomic background. It's none of that. The style of your worship, the amount of your worship, the crazy of your worship. Listen, I'm going to speak for myself. The more crazy I get in worship, here's what you know. I am remembering the hell that God took me out of. Because the bigger the praise, the bigger the worship, the bigger the hands, the stomp of the feet. What's happening in that moment is I am being downloaded the memory of the hell that God took me straight out of. And the future that is promised in him. So worship, don't get it twisted. Worship is not deduced to a style, to a denomination, to a culture. Worship belongs to him and him alone. That was a man went, oh, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit always makes me look like I don't work out. No, but listen. <laughs> Worship is also a tool to use when real life happens and it's hard to worship. Worship is a tool in warfare that we have full access to because life happens. And sometimes all you can do is drag yourself to one of these seats and go, just, I just got to let your oil pour on me, God. And just trust that this is all I have. Worship is a weapon in warfare and it is a tool for us to continue to practice over and over and over. So it gets so strong that we learn how to use it on the dime. Laying aside ourselves to be prostrated in the presence of God allows for the war in our minds to be subject to the supernatural power of worship. Okay? I want us to take a look at a brain scan real quick. And it's the progression. It is the progression of negative, depressed thoughts, okay, over time with the frequency of music being played. And worship music being played. Now, the reason I like this is because it shows us what chemically happens when music begins to play. And those warm spots that you're seeing, those are in different parts of our brain that elicit different hormones like dopamine. This is happy. Okay. Which is why there's not a lot over here. Okay. Here's why this is important for us to know. I love this study. I came to this, I came across this study. It's an Oxford academic, and I love the way that they started out this study. They basically started out saying that research has linked several aspects of religion, including church membership, um, intercession, uh, religious coping strategies, all those things with positive mental health outcomes. However, this study examines a neglected dimension of religious life, listening to religious music, which I found fascinating because it was like, well, you're going to do everything else except music. So they finally did a, a study on it. Its findings were that the frequency of listening to religious music is associated with a decrease in death, anxiety, depression, and increases in life satisfaction, self-esteem, and a sense of self-control. So we know that music affects our thoughts and feelings. But we know. I, I mean, if you don't know, that's okay. But it's not the newest study. It's not the newest academic study. I mean, in high school when I was like, well, he don't like me as much as I like him, so I would put on boys to men. Be a little sad because boys to men could be sad with me. So we know that music can affect your thoughts, okay? Here's why I appreciate studies in academic journals, though. Because we often try to circumvent what God tells us to do in order to journey through a faster way to fix our emotions. We often want to circumvent something like worshiping God because it didn't work the first time. I was still sad. 
Now, in some cases, I'm not talking about the cases where you have journeyed through a very prayerful uh, process of how to deal with something that's a little bit more out of your control mental health-wise, okay? I'm not talking about that. There's pursuit in those professional ways to pursue more of God and have peace about how to deal with those things. But what I am saying is pursue that help with worship music. Pursue that help with, don't deny God, don't deduce worship to a moment, to a one-time fix. It is a lifestyle. God will not be replaced by anything else especially ourselves. He's not here to be in competition for the number one spot to be worshipped. You see, in this study, it was not the mere presence of religious music in this study that gained more positive chemicals in the narrative thoughts, in the neurological patterns. It wasn't the mere presence of it. It was the frequency of it. Does God say worship me for 30 to 60, 90 days or your money back guaranteed? No, he does not. It is day and night, night and day, let incense arise. It is holy, 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 all day, all night. We're going to be up with the angels, holy, 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 holy. As far as I'm concerned, that's what we were created to do and that's what we're going to be doing on the other side of eternity is worshiping the one true king. Valuing the process means you also have to value longevity. And I found this interesting. In Psalms 119, verse 164, David says, I will praise you seven times a day because all your regulations are just. Now get this. Modern neurological studies say that change, to change a habitual thought pattern, okay, it can take up to 5 to 15 minutes a day on average from 3 to 6 months. Maybe a a lot of studies will put 144 days as like the meat in the middle. But here's why this is important. If you take the math of what David was committing to, that is actually equivalent to about 12 minutes a day for three months. Modern neurological studies is a little far removed from when David wrote this verse. What I love about it is God actually does know everything. This is not the newest finding. Five to 15 minutes a day of positive, you know, affirmations and, you know, doing yoga on your head for 352 times a day. Those things might be new to us, but they're not new to God. David committed to seven times a day because God is the creator of all things, even our brains, which can create our own thoughts. What does this do for us? This gives us back the power to choose who we worship. Are we worshiping our circumstance? Are we worshiping ourselves? Are we worshiping the inconvenience? What are we worshiping? If we have proof, both in the natural and the supernatural, that it is worshiping our one true God, that both scientifically alleviates negative thought patterns and supernaturally alleviates sickness, depression, poverty, Restoring familial relationships, let's try going to that. Because on the onset of negative feelings and, and beliefs and thoughts, why is it then if we know all of this, why is it then that we default to old patterns? Because they're familiar. And familiar is less scary. Feels less risky. But it's not. It's the one true king. It's the one true king who deserves it all. Now, I'm not standing up here telling you something that my husband and I don't know. Because when life hits, it'll sometimes knock you down. And you need some other people to help you. Before we had our last little girl, um, I had experienced my second miscarriage. And that miscarriage was our boy. Now, if you don't know, my husband and I have four little girls. Bless the Lord for those spicy little things that love to wake up at the same hour no matter how late they go to bed. But that miscarriage was our little boy. And I remember sitting in the kitchen, and the only strength I had in my thumbs was to text one of my sisters. I think it was both my sisters. I don't remember, actually now. Um, And one of my best friends. 
And I said, I just don't know what to do. That's all I said. I just don't know what to do. And they had the strength enough for me to go just push play. Some worship songs and just start saying thank you. Just give them your worship and thank you. Life will hit and you won't want to. I can promise you that. But in that moment, the only strength I had was to push play. And this is what I told the Lord. You have to trust that I'm thanking you for something in my spirit because I can't think of anything right now. And I would love to tell you that within that hour, it was supernatural. And my miracle was within an hour, we were awesome. And Gabriella came with the ease. No, in fact, her pregnancy was the hardest pregnancy we had. And we went about three months checking in week to week because we didn't know if we were going to lose her or not. I'd love to tell you that it was so easy and the miracle was, was great and everything. No, my miracle, because it's still a miracle, took about a year. We don't get to rob God of miracles just because some take longer than the other. Worship is longevity. Worship is longevity. I didn't worship for 17 minutes and then all of a sudden everything was rewired up here and my heart was fixed and everything getting ready to have a baby again was fixed. No, it took almost a year. But my miracle is still my miracle. And it came through my people in my life helping to set my face right back here. And I want to tell you to surround yourself today with people who have scars from worshiping when it was hard. Who know how to worship and sacrifice even when hell was coming to knock at their doors. There are some of you in here today. We've got some mamas and papas in here. Stephen and Christine Smith, Ken and Sandy Aldridge, uh, Lila and Carl Dobbins. We've just got these, these mamas and these papas in here. And there are some of you, I know your story. I know what it takes for you to get to church. Still disappointed. Still wondering, but I'm worshiping. I'm giving you my all. I actually know everything she's talking about this morning but you're still not doing what you said you'd do. I know what it's taking some of you to be here today. There is strength and there is supernatural ability when you sacrifice everything you're coming in with. Just table it and lay prostrate with the people of God who can just build a fortress around you and cover you in worship. Can I tell you the best thing for you to do when hell comes knocking at your door is get in the house of God because the people of God will surround you and make a fortress of worship that the enemy will go, oh no, I didn't know they knew to go to the church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Worship is the Lord's top love language. Y'all know about love languages. My husband will always tell couples we do premarital with. Five love languages is a great tool to learn how to love your spouse, your future spouse, because what it is is it's practicing putting on their shoes of how to be loved, not your own. It's actually practicing how to continually get out of your shoes, put theirs on until they kind of fit so that you can love them well. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. He'll often tell all the premarital couples that we do premarital with, he'll tell them that's what Jesus did. Jesus came and took human form and walked in every single one of our love languages before he sacrificed himself because it was worth it, because we're worth it to him. And so as we close today, if you will, stand with me. We're going to ask the Lord for a fresh infilling of perspective, of strength, of his power, of his spirit. So that as we walk out today, we know and are confident that we are sons and daughters of the one true king. And that he loves us as much as we're willing to love him, if not infinitely more. If you need prayer today, we're going to have some prayer partners up here. And if you need prayer because there's anything in you that you know is difficult for you to sacrifice in order for you to be holy, fully prostrate in the presence of God, they'll pray with you today. Bring it to God. He wants it because he wants you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you don't force yourself in, but you teach us how to desire you and to want you. 
God, I ask right now that we would be a people that would be ready and willing to sacrifice anything and everything that comes in between us and you. God, that we'd be willing to sacrifice ourselves our own preferences, our own worries, our own fears in order to fully be present with you and to worship you day and night and night and day. We love you, Father. We love you. We love you. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.